What did Clark Gable have to sacrifice for his Hollywood career? How Loretta Young's family made plans to conceal her pregnancy on their own. The handsome rakish king of Hollywood in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, Clark Gable was considered a model of 20th century American masculinity. Loretta Young came to the pictures poor from a working class family with no formal training. She first appeared on screen at the age of three when she was still known by her birth name of Gretchen. She was cute and took instruction well but the same was true of her other two sisters who, like so many young kids in Hollywood during the silent era, made extra dimes by appearing as extras after school. Loretta didn't distinguish herself until aged 14, when, according to law, a director telephoned to request her sister Polly to which Gretchen replied, Polly isn't in, but why don't you use me? I'm better looking and a better actress. Silent star Colleen Moore became her mentor, giving her the name Loretta. In 1928, Young starred opposite Lon Chaney in Laugh Clown Laugh, in what would become her breakout role. In part because, even at the age of 15, she was ethereally beautiful. With two equally beautiful sisters, Young's home became the go-to hangout for some of the younger boys around Hollywood. One of the sisters was almost always to be at home when anyone called, but this was no house of ill repute. Young's mother, Gladys, had converted to Catholicism and was filled with the sort of religious vigour that entailed a convent education for each of the girls, weekly suppers with friendly priests, and a rigid code of conduct. Which is why Loretta's elopement at the age of 17 with 28-year-old actor Grant Withers fractured the family. It wasn't that Loretta had absconded without her mother's knowledge, at least not entirely. The sin was far more grave. Withers wasn't Catholic. To punish Loretta, her mother refused to speak to her and forced her sisters to do the same, even when one was serving as Loretta's body double. Young quickly became disenchanted with her marriage and returned home, at which point a visiting priest, Father Ward, told her something that would guide Young's decisions from that point forward. I've already spoken with two 16-year-old girls who each wanted to elope. They said, if Loretta Young can do it, why can't I? Ward concluded by paraphrasing Matthew 18.6. Rather than give bad example, you should have a stone tied around your neck and be thrown into the sea. You have to decide, Loretta. Where are you going? Heaven or hell? Her priest's warnings and parental shunning affected Young deeply, but she was still a sucker for romance. She separated from Withers after less than a year and embarked on the beginning of her time as the gayest divorcee, as one headline put it. She was consistently framed as a woman of great beauty and greater emotion. Currently she is out of love and hard to date. She has moody weeks like these, occasionally when she fancies herself the lonesome garbo type. Then she's falling in love again, despite protestations that she never wanted to. She just can't help it. She fell for another actor. He married someone else. She fell for a businessman. He died during an operation, and then she fell for Spencer Tracy, a Catholic, but a Catholic married to another woman.
Tracy and Young met on the set of A Man's Castle in 1933, when he was newly separated from his wife of 10 years. Both Tracy and his wife acknowledged the separation to the press, and Tracy appeared frequently with Young. It was a public courtship, but one that couldn't come to a happy end, as Tracy, a Catholic, refused to divorce. He hung out at the Young family home, a point captured in home movie footage taken with a camera that Tracy himself had given Young. But for all their flirtation, Young remained chaste. You can see it in her goodbye letter to Tracy, which Tracy kept until his death. Today, Linda and Chris keep a facsimile in their guest house, which doubles as a loosely organised Young archive, where her massive hat and glove collection seeps into endless stacks of glamour shots, posters and family photos. In the letter, Young's words are coded, but her intentions are clear. When I am with you or listening to your voice, I seem to have little or no logic or common sense and certainly no resistance, she wrote. But, unless I'm able at this time to see you and still live up to the promise I made five years ago, to never again, under any circumstance, forget him to the extent of committing a sin, it will be impossible for us to see each other again unless we can truthfully and honestly be a good boy and a good girl. It's enough for me just to be able to look at you and talk with you, Young continued, and although this might sound stupid to say at this time, I know I could do it if I even had a tiny bit of help from you, Spencer. Tracy, however, couldn't keep up his end of the forever chaste bargain. He and Young parted just as she was about to begin location shooting for Call of the Wild, a high-budget 20th century film based on Jack London's juvenile adventure of the same name. It was a loose adaptation, picking up on only one of the text's plot lines in which a prospector heads to Alaska looking for a gold mine finds a woman in distress, rescues said woman, and allows a dog to steal the show. It was a perfect role for Clark Gable, whose studio MGM was in the midst of renovating his image as a romantic lover into that of a hardened he-man. When Gable, the 22-year-old young, and the rest of the crew left for Mount Baker, Washington in January of 1935, Gable was a month from winning Best Actor for his turn in It Happened One Night. He was also a known womanizer constantly at war with his second wife, who rebelled against his constant philandering, most notably with fellow MGM star Joan Crawford. Those relations, along with a purported drunk driving accident in 1934 that killed a pedestrian, were kept quiet by MGM's legendary team of fixers, who helped shape the raw and often scandalous star material into sanitised images ready for public consumption. Every studio had a set of fixers, including Young's home studio of 20th century, yet apart from well-placed fan magazine articles around her divorce from Withers, she hadn't needed their services. She was a flirt, but not a reckless one. Still, it was common practice for unmarried starlets to have chaperones, usually a friend or family member, when shooting on location. When the train left for Washington State, Young was accompanied by Frances Fanny Earle, a friend of one of her sisters. The plan was to shoot in the Mount Baker wilderness about three hours drive from Seattle for several weeks, but after the entire crew travelled 65 miles to the base camp, Eight days of blizzard socked them in. 
With temperatures of 11 degrees below zero, even the film in the camera froze. When Young was doused in water for a scene, her teeth started chattering so hard that she began to cry uncontrollably. Co-star Jack Oakey sent the studio a tongue-in-cheek letter. Am lost in deep snowdrifts. Send St Bernard Dog with keg of brandy. Will return dog. In the end, director William Wellman eked out a total of six days of shooting during the nearly nine weeks they spent on location. When Young and Gable weren't sequestered in their quarters, they clowned around and flirted like mad, a flirtation Young herself caught on camera. Mom used to tell me that every performance involved falling a little bit in love with her co-star, Linda Lewis explained sitting in her Florida home and sorting through various Loretta keepsakes. By total coincidence, the 1945 young film Along Came Jones was airing on Turner Classic Movies that morning, and Chris Lewis would periodically pause to point out a scene in which Young was beautiful, or wooden, or funny. In location and isolated by snow, it made sense that feeling between the two co-stars amplified. Gable would call out, where's my girl, whenever he was looking for Young. Young openly loved attention and the exploitation thereof and believed, as she told Ed Funk years later, that so long as no boundaries were crossed, she wasn't doing anything wrong. Rumours travelled to Hollywood that Gable had made a conquest of yet another co-star, but Young was still heartbroken over Tracy. As she recalled in a 1950 article in Hollywood magazine, I was only a careless youngster at the time, spending most of the time at the window, waiting for the messenger boy on snowshoes, to bring the mail in which I thought there might be a letter from a lad in Los Angeles in whom I was deeply interested. Later in life, she remained firm that for all her flirtation with Gable, nothing sexual took place between them, and the paper-thin walls that afforded only visual privacy of their lodgings would certainly have made it difficult, if not impossible. Every performance involved falling a little bit in love with her co-star. When 20th Century finally called the production home in February, Young thought their flirtation would come to a natural end. For the overnight train back to Hollywood, the stars were given individual sleeping compartments, while the crew, including Young's companion, was seated and sleeping elsewhere on the train. At some point in the night, Gable entered Young's compartment. Young never spoke of the specifics of what occurred to anyone not to her sisters, mother, husbands or children, until decades later. In some ways, Young's situation was impossibly unique, yet it also recalls the millions of unwanted sexual encounters that entire generations of women did not talk about, in part because they couldn't, they literally did not have the language to do so. But back in 1935, Young had to deal with a train arriving at the station early in the morning and her mother there to greet it. Once they arrived, Young did the only polite thing and invited Gable to breakfast with her mother. Going about life as usual had and would continue to be Young's primary coping mechanism. She was so humiliated, and what she would do when she was humiliated was just on with the show. Because she had been trained since the age of three, you put a good face on it, and you go forward. She knew she'd have to continue working with him. Which is precisely what she did. Young and Gable filmed the remaining scenes for Call of the Wild on the 20th century backlot, sustaining the rumours of Gable and Young's involvement. 
A month after shooting wrapped, Gable's wife, Rhea, called Young with a plan. She was hosting a party, and if Young showed up, they'd shut down press speculation. But Young declined, not because she wanted the rumours to continue, but because she'd very recently deduced that she was pregnant. How could this be happening, she asked, after realising she was pregnant. It was just that one time. In the weeks before, one of Young's sisters had walked to Loretta's room and heard her weeping. In interviews with Ed Funk, Sally recalls telling her sister that her menstrual cycle might simply be off track and suggested she get a massage to right its course. But Young's period didn't return and the sisters resolved to tell their mother, who, after requisite tears, helped devise a plan. First, they confirmed the pregnancy with their family physician, Dr. Halloran, enlisting his secrecy and discretion for the birth, which would take place in November. Young had been on contract long enough to know that if she had told 20th Century about the pregnancy, chances were they would have arranged for a swift and secret abortion, which had or would soon happen to Jean Harlow, Kay Francis and Judy Garland, but which Young considered a mortal sin. So the family made plans to conceal the pregnancy on their own.